Before we get into the show, a quick reminder to check out and subscribe to the Beer Edge podcast with Andy Crouch. Each week, he's doing deep dives into breweries, talking with journalists covering the beer space, and unpacking a lot of what makes the beer industry so interesting. Find the Beer Edge podcast wherever you download shows. Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall, on the road this week in Nashville, where my guests are Brady Duncan, a co-founder of Mad Tree Brewing in Ohio, and Ryan Blevins, the head brewer. We're talking about recipe development, growth, and evolution, and what brewers can do to help the environment. But first, an invitation to check out BeerEdge.com for articles to sign up for the newsletter and more. And also check over to Facebook and the This Week and Rauk Beer page, or you can follow along with all the smoked beer goodness at TW Rauk Beer on Twitter and Instagram. And we're able to bring you this show every week thanks to these sponsors, including NZ Hops. In a little country far down in the Pacific, you'll find a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. Years of partnership with a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations sees the current day master growers proudly providing 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz where you can find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd to learn more. And by Brees, the leading supplier of specialty malt to craft brewers. They offer the broadest product line in the industry, including a wide range of roasted malts that add flavor, color, and character to beer. Their experienced operators handcraft every batch of roasted malt to ensure the product you get is consistent. Check out brewingwithbreece.com for beer recipes using roasted malt. And... The best brewmasters are obsessed with creating high-quality, consistent products. That means reducing mass viscosity for better wort separation and increasing brew house efficiency. UltraFlow Max from Novozymes helps you achieve both. It's time to brew with enzymes, increase your brew house efficiency, and achieve faster filtration today with UltraFlow Max. Order a free sample today at brewingwithenzymes.com slash beeredge. So it felt almost normal last week in Nashville, Tennessee, when Yazoo's Brewings Embrace the Funk held its annual Funk Fest, and I was on hand to guide some discussions, but also used it as an opportunity to sit down with some folks to catch up on what's been going on in the real world or not real world or whatever world we're in right now. So this week, I'm talking with Brady Duncan. He's a co-founder of Mad Tree Brewing in Ohio, and Ryan Blevins, who's the head brewer. The brewery has come a long way since Duncan and his other homebrew-minded founders went pro and fueled by the growth of, growth of their IPA, but with a passion for lagers and crazy experimentation, that's where the mad comes in. They're consistently turning out new beers and trying to push within and beyond established styles. The tree in the name actually stems from their environmental commitment. They walk the walk with giving back, not only being part of the 1% for the planet initiative, but making volunteer time part of employment. And they're always thinking about ways of lowering the brewery's impact in the world when it comes to environmental issues. During the show, it might get a little bit noisy at times. Folks were setting up for a beer festival after all. And because it's been a while since I last used the mobile rig, the gents had to share a single mic between them. Still, with all of that, I hope you enjoy. Here's our conversation. What were the ideals that Mad Tree was founded on? Oh, man. Heavy hitting right out of the gate. Oh, yeah. Love it. Um, yeah, I mean, it speaks a little bit to the name. You know, we've got... Uh, frankly a lot of different stories about what the name means and what mad tree means but i think at its most simple level right we took two words and put them together so <laughs> um genius yeah yeah so the i think the mad kind of speaks to frankly as home brewers um we would brew just about most of the first beers that we released we probably brewed 20 to 30 times in my basement okay um where it was kind of changing one ingredient at a time so kind of this scientific method the madness if you want to call it that and then I think on the other side of it, right, the tree was more about the, the kind of roots of the brewery, the softer side, the community side. Um, and then as we always say, we just really fucking like trees. So um, 
Yeah, so, you know, and it's kind of morphed into a thing of its own, which I think is kind of a bit like the brewery is, um, taking, you know, two simple words and making a new word that has a completely different meaning, so. How, how much does your homebrew roots, but also just the ideal behind what the brewery was in the beginning, how much does that inform the beers that you want to make these days? I think, so I will say early on, um, and it's weird, it's weird to think now, when we first launched, our beers were considered like pretty bold. Um, and frankly, what, what was it? Like, what was a good early example of yeah, something so, that so people our, our thought first, was bold? Our first five beers were more of a West Coast IPA, which frankly in Cincinnati, no one was really doing. Um, now it's a pretty tame IPA by okay. market standards. Um, we had an amber that we hopped up. We had a brown that we hopped up. We had a porter that we hopped up. Um, and, that was our, and then we did a Russian Imperial Stout, which really no one locally was doing. So I remember we opened our tap room. Those were our those were our five beers on tap. The lowest ABV was six percent, um, and it was easy to come in and have a few beers and and get a little tipsy. So yeah, pr- pretty quickly, we were like, man, we got to make something like you know a lot more approachable than this. And that's where that's where we kind of started taking off with it. But I think you know we were inspired, frankly, early on as we looked at the the kind of market out there. Very simply, we were just trying to bring kind of the cool culture that we were seeing in other other towns to Cincinnati. Cincinnati is steeped in like a lot of German beer heritage, which I respect the hell out of. It's yeah. cool, but it's not us. So I would say, you know, breweries like Bell's, um, we did Identity Crisis. It was a, a hoppy porter that was very much based on uh, Sublimely Self-Righteous from Stone, which okay. was a beer I absolutely loved. So that's a little bit of maybe like the origins for the beers early on. I think you could probably talk more to kind of now. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't around during the homebrew days. I, I started with Matchery about six months after they actually opened. So, um, but we still, we still do a lot of that style of beer. Um, I mean, we're still built on, on Psychopathy, our, our house IPA, Centennial, Chinook and Cascade. Like that's yeah. Still classics. Classic. Yeah. It works. It sells well for us. You know, it's our core beer. Um, and I fucking love it still. Um, but you know, we have, we have a great tap room that allows us to, uh, play with all kinds of, all kinds of beers. And, um, we take a pretty unique approach to we actually have like a recipe team um, there's like three or four of us that write recipes um, because our tap room um, we have almost 30 taps it allows us to be creative and have fun but we have four different people writing recipes we all look at beer differently you know we all might approach it like oh I, I, i'm gonna brew a hellas these are the parameters i have to brew in, into um where i like to look at it like what is the intent you know and what's the drinking experience like and then from there, how do I achieve that? You know, um, I don't know. Fuck style guidelines is kind of where I'm at most of the time. You know, um, as well. I mean, styles don't exist anymore. Right. Yeah, and and that's okay. You know, at least to me it is. Um, and there are a lot of people that love the British style still, and 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 I like that, and we do as well. You know, I mean, but we do all kinds of fun stuff. I mean, that's the fun thing about beer. Yeah. You know, you can do whatever the hell you want. But when you're so I, I'm curious about this uh, this like recipe team. Yeah. It, 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 it's I'm almost thinking of like as a, like a band getting together and like everybody's contributing sort of their own thing. Um, are there hurt feelings? Are there you know is it like a fun collaborative effort or like what's Absolutely. the like? Yeah, it, yeah. We we meet weekly. Um, we talk about the new beers we have on tap, uh, and we're all openly and honest with each other about what we liked and what we didn't like about it and what we would change next time we did it. Um, and we all learn from each other, you know? So, yeah, there are hurt feelings, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're adults. Yeah, I'll say too, like, in, this is a little bit off off of that, but I'll say, for me personally, I know Ryan feels the same way. Some of the proudest moments at Mad Tree are when, frankly, brewers leave and start their own thing. Um, we've got a guy who just started a brewery called Esoteric that worked for us for years um, in Cincinnati. And super proud of him. We have another brewer who's leaving soon to start a brewery. Um, I take a lot of pride in that. And I think that that kind of goes to a lot of the the freedom that I think Ryan gives a lot of the team to come up with new beers. So that's an interesting thing. I mean, you're now like opening up all these fun veins of conversation. But like when you've been around for as long as you have, when you're as big as you guys are, it is natural that people are going to leave and go hang their own shingle and 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 do that type of thing. There's some breweries that are angry about that saying like you know like why are you taking what you learned here and now you're going to be my competitor or or things like that but you you don't see it that way you see it as more of a yeah i i I definitely don't uh i mean you know we are a larger company but 
We're also a small company, so you know, there's there's not a lot of positions at the brewery, so there's not a lot of room for growth until people move on. And if people are moving on because they've learned enough working with us to be able to start their own brewery, yeah, I fucking love that. You know, and that gives opportunity for other folks on our team to grow and learn and, and enhance their skill. So. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I mean, I think Madtree in the last few years has been on a bit of a an introspection in terms of like, right when we started the brewery, there were 2,000 craft breweries in the U.S. There's now, I don't know, eight, nine. 9,000 yeah, plus, yeah. Plus breweries in the U.S. So we kind of took a step back and we were like, who are we? Why do we exist why should anyone give a shit about us versus the other 9,000 breweries? And I think we've really been working on elevating the brand and thinking much more holistic as our company, as a hospitality company, a consumer experience company, and most importantly, a company with impact that wants to leave the community better. And I know, look, it's craft beer. Everyone says community, right? Um, we used to have our, 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 our tagline was beer builds community, and community builds beer, right? You don't meet a brewer who, who sits here and says, yeah, we make shitty beer and we don't take care of our community, right? I mean, it's right. kind of ingrained in craft beer, but I think the way that we're elevating a lot of the work we're doing in the impact space, but then that filters down to like growing our beer community. Um, I mean, I, I take a lot of pride. Breweries like us, Rheingeist 50 West, I think had, have kind of built the, the local scene um, that now has 50 plus breweries and is employing a, a shit ton of people. And I take a lot of pride in that. So when people leave, I just see that as an extension of like what we're trying to do as a, as a company. But it's interesting that you're saying, you know, consumer experiences and uh, hospitality as well, because those are two things that early on in beer, it was just, you know, hey, we're just making beer, you know? And, but now like breweries have to be more than that, right? Because with 9,000, you know, 9,000 breweries out there, you have all this competition and you want to make sure that the dollars are coming into your in, into your tap room. When you think about, I guess one, you know, the beers that you're putting out, but two, the experience that you want people to have. What were those conversations like, and where did you settle on, you know, this new iteration? Yeah, or this new chapter. Yeah, to be honest, we're still figuring it out. I mean, I will say I can kind of answer that maybe two ways. Okay. The interesting thing is, so I, I had an intern two and a half years ago. And I was really curious on what brings people into Mad Tree. So I literally, I, I asked her to go out for four hours on a Friday between like 4 and 8 p.m. And just ask people why they were there. One person literally mentioned beer. Now I want to be clear about that. That does not mean that beer is not important. Right. It, it is absolutely the foundation of everything that we do. And, and beer is bringing people in. But the reasons we're on top of that, which is what makes beer special, right? I'm coming here to show an out-of-town guest this place. I'm celebrating a friend's birthday. I'm meeting coworkers for a beer. The place is convenient to me. So I think starting to understand like why people visit our spaces. And then I think as well, right, if we start thinking, in, and I'm not going to necessarily try to go down this rabbit hole, but if we start thinking about, you know, as an industry, who do we want visiting our places, right? We've tended to be, as an industry, a very like white bearded guy culture. And the people who come in, if we just kind of do it like we've always done, we are not going to build an inclusive kind of space that I think a lot of other people feel welcome into unless we're very actively trying to manage against that. So um, so I think for us, it's, it's, it's really about just paying attention to it. Um, and, and we're doing that. We're opening a new space early next year downtown, and that's going to be a completely different experience. It's more bar restaurant. It's going to be kind of a green space, local farm to table food. But that is a space that we're really going to kind of try to curate a different experience because we want to show people a different side of what our brand is and that we can kind of elevate the brand beyond right just a bunch of dudes making homebrew in their in their basement. Yeah. One of the things, though, on, on the beer side of things that I'm curious about is as people are talking about broadening customer bases and talking about bringing new people in and being more inclusive, a lot of that does go back to beer styles and making approachable beer styles because, you know, we're sitting here at Funk Fest and, you know, the beers that are going to be poured today, pretty esoteric or wild and, you know, like there's, it's, it's a niche inside of a niche already, you know, so like people who are coming to this are committed to coming to this, but if you dropped in a random stranger from, you know, that's just hanging out in downtown Nashville, they're gonna be like, what the, what the fuck is this? Um, so as you're thinking about broadening out and diversifying um, the experience, how does that play into the beer? Or does it play into the beer? Uh, absolutely plays into the beer. Um, and like Brady said, that's definitely something we're still working through and trying to figure out how that works. Um, but that's why, you know, like this beer we're drinking today, Legendary Lager, 
and that's one of the main reasons why we brewed this beer. You know, we wanted something that, you know, was great, great quality beer, you know, that was approachable, that everybody could drink and want, you know. Um, it's it's hard. It really is, because there's also the beer geek in me, you know. Yeah. Once that, that, that's why we're here at Funk Fest, you know. Like, so, um, I don't know. I don't have a great answer for that yet. Uh, we're still definitely trying to figure it out, though. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, so one of the things we do, uh, we have this arm of our uh, quality lab called the Flavor Space Force. The Flavor Space Force? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, but it really allows us to hone in on uh, recipes quickly um, through different types of trials in our lab. But uh, most importantly, do, do uh, we call it taproom missions, where we actually um, will set up a, a kegerator in the, in the tap room. Uh, we'll put four beers on tap. We'll have people come over and be like, hey, we'd love to tell you, uh, we'd love you to taste this. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you don't like, you know. Um, here's a QR code. Scan this. It goes to a Google form. They fill it out. And then we have all kinds of data that really helps us, like, hone in on recipes and really figure out what the hell people want to drink, you know. How, how accurate do you find that to be, though? You know, I'm thinking, like, home brews. Like, you know, there, it, there's a lot of home brewers that go pro because their buddies think that their beer is great. And then, you know, you taste it and you're like, ah, your friends are being nice to you. Like that kind of thing. If you're asking people, like, how, do you feel like you're getting honest feedback? I do, yeah. We've had some pretty successful tapper missions. Um, but you do have to learn how to really read into the data. You know, there are four-ounce samples. You know, a lot of times people are going to gravitate to the one that's probably the most intense, flavor-wise. Yeah. Um, and you really got to think about, all right, you know, the consumers really liked, the customers that were in our tapper really liked the one that was the most intense. But you also got to think about the drinkability of that beer over the course, you know, you want them to buy a six pack. You, know? yeah. you don't want them to have one and be done. So um, it just, it's taken us a while to, get, to hone in on that. But I, I definitely find that that information is very valuable and it's been very accurate for us. So. Um, what are the beers that really inspire you as a brewer? Like what, like what do you like mashing in on? What do you, what's your, what's your wheelhouse? What's your go-to? I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to say the typical brewer thing right now, but lagers. Okay. Lagers and IPAs. Um, and clear IPAs. Classic West Coast IPAs. I mean, that's, you know, we hang our hat on psychopathy. I mean, it's Centennial Schmuck and Cascade. Like I said, I, I absolutely <laughs> love those hops. You know, um, they're a workhorse for us. Um, we contract some great lots out of Crosby every year for that beer. Um, and to be able to make that day in and day out like we have for the past eight years and it be consistent and great and people still love to come drink it like I mean that's that's what I get excited about is West Coast IPA a hard sell these days I mean obviously not for you guys if it's doing that well but like in the grand scheme of things where Hayes rules the roost uh, at least in you know maybe hearts and minds um, you know like I, I still prefer bitterness I still like you know yeah, I think... Clarity in my beer, yeah. I think there's a lot to that. I, I mean, it, it, if I think about newer breweries who are starting, I don't see a lot of newer breweries starting off with a pretty standard IPA, right? If they are doing a standard IPA, it, it's almost starting to get more in that. It might not be hazy, but it's certainly playing on a lot more tropical, juicy flavors. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's... Uh, I don't know. The market's interesting. I, I think for me, like, kind of the, to the question around, like, beers, I love beers that I feel like... Um, can meet like multiple occasions depending on how I'm feeling so like I'll use there's two beers that immediately come to mind Sierra Nevada Pale Ale that is a beer if I just want to sit and play guitar or not think about beer with my kids or whatever I drink that beer and it's delicious if I want to sit there and, di and dissect the beer it's beautiful I feel, used to feel that way about like Victory Prima Pills which yeah. really did that for me Yeah. Um, but I love beers that, that like can be very very simple and don't command a lot of attention um, or beers that, if you want to give the beer a lot of attention, you can. Um, yeah. What about for you, though? Like, is that, when you're thinking about, you know, the recipes that you're putting out there, do you want people to just sit and enjoy it, or are you happy if they're sort of dissecting it in their mind a little bit? I mean, I think I'm not doing my job right if they're not dissecting it a little bit, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, when I walk out into our tap room and I see people with that beer in their hand and they're just happy and they're talking to each other and they're not thinking about it, um, that means we've done it right, you know. Um, I, I like drinkability. I like some that they just, they don't have to, they just have fun with it. Yeah. You know? 
So Mantry is part of 1% for the Planet, which is a really cool, uh, really cool organization. Um, I've had other guests on the show. We've talked about it in the past. Um, when you were putting the idea for the brewery together, um, and you've mentioned community a few times, but like right on the front page of your website is all of the initiatives that you've done. You know, like you, you, it's not just like, hey, come drink our beer, but like you want people to feel good about where their money's going and, 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 and what they're doing. Um, talk to me just about some of the initiatives that you all are doing, how they came up and, you know, why they were important to you in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's been a journey for us. I mean, I think this, you know, it, I kind of said earlier, right, we used to have this, this tagline that was beer builds community, community builds beer. Yeah. And frankly, that was just far too vague. And our strategy early on, the first five years of Matchery, six years of Matchery was, we're just going to build community. So, and we had this like portfolio approach of how we were going to give money, what we were going to participate in. It was like, we're going to do some stuff for kids and some stuff for dogs and some stuff for nature. And we started like just taking a step back and we're like, look, we're passionate about all those things, but like the shit we really care about is our environment. And, you know, it's in our name, right? It's, it's you know, tree, obviously. So I think as, as we really started kind of looking inward on what do we really want to make an impact with and we're making small splashes here and there yeah you know that's what we really focus back on right we want to have an impact in our local community um, by giving back by volunteering so one of the things every employee volunteers 16 hours um, this is the first year we're, we're, we are requiring it so we're actually having conversations right now about what if we get to the end of the year and an employee doesn't have 16 hours what do we do um, I think it's, I, I don't know how hard we're going to enforce that one yet, but next year we're absolutely going to enforce it. Okay. Um, so volunteering is huge. Um, you know, 1% is just a beautiful guideline for us. And that's really, that was really the founding of it, right? It was Yvonne Chenard from Patagonia, Craig Matthews from Blue Fly Ribbons. Yep. And, you know, giving to large organizations, they didn't feel like their, their impact was localized. And all 1% really is, is it just kind of qualifies vendors and it qualifies right a lane of giving so we've qualified roughly 15 nonprofits locally our biggest our biggest partner is Cincinnati Parks um, so we go out we've we've actually done a project to beautify an inner city park where they're gonna put an Ezra Charles statue he was the the heavyweight box, boxing champ from Cincinnati he was actually featured on the legendary lager can oh, about okay. a month ago um, it's transitioned over to Emma Gatewood who was the first woman to, to through hike the Appalachian Trail at That's age 69 awesome. yeah um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's a lot that we're doing. We're, we're partnering with the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, there's a uh, inner city school that they have a rooftop garden that we go and, and basically prep and clean up. So when the kids come into school, that, they kind of maintain that garden, very hands-on learning. So um, it's a lot, but we are very focused on, I mean, we talk about our purposes to con connect people to nature and each other. And that's really what we're focused on doing from us. More with the fellows from Mad Tree in just a minute, but first a word from the folks who help keep the mics hot over here, including NZ Hops, a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted over 150 years to produce some of the world's finest hops. NZ Hops are like no others, unique in their flavors and aromas. Visit nzhops.co.nz to explore more. And Brees is proud to control their malt, starting in the field until it arrives at your brewery. They have long-term relationships with several hundred growers in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming and Montana, where warm days, cool nights, and floodwater irrigation yield some of the highest quality barley in the U.S. And the best brewmasters are obsessed with creating high-quality, consistent products. And that means reducing mass viscosity for better wart separation and increasing brew house efficiency. Ultraflow Max from Novozymes helps you achieve both. Order a free sample today at brewingwithenzymes.com slash beer edge. And now back to Brady Duncan and Ryan Blevins of Mad Tree in Ohio. It's um, just going back to the volunteer aspect of it, right? If you have new employees who come on or people who are there um, and they know that this is going to be part of the job requirement yep. um, or part of just, you know, the cost of doing business with you guys and working there. Um, do you find that that helps build a better internal? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, Community I, commu uh, structure. Yep. Yeah. The yeah. words are escaping me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. My, yeah, internal my, culture, I guess, is what I was trying to say. My, yeah, my vocabulary is about 50% of normal, which is usually a pretty small vocabulary, anyways. Yeah, oh. yeah, uh, yeah. For the record, we were out at various <laughs> artists last night. You guys were out after I was, but uh, yeah. uh, I had to put myself to bed pretty early last yeah. night with good reason. But yeah, uh, yeah. Um, no, I mean, we, but we, yeah, yeah, we, we we absolutely see it with with new people that come in. Um, we are we are setting setting the tone kind of like right away, and and I will tell you, it helps us attract people, um, absolutely, because they come in and it's like, man, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be required to and be paid to volunteer, and and the way we structure is pretty much 12 of those hours have to be through our one percent partners, and we set up tons of volunteer activities. Like we were, we were just doing a litter pickup in our neighborhood yesterday as part of this. Okay. Actually, sorry, this morning. Um, and then some of it is you can get paid up to four hours if you're passionate about dogs and you want to go volunteer at a shelter. We'll pay you four hours to go do that. But it's absolutely, uh, it is absolutely building our culture. And, and it's been a transition, don't get me wrong. For a lot of people who've been at the company for a long time, they're seeing different iterations of our brand and they're kind of like, where, where are we going? We started off as like this small brewery that was just cranking out beer and now right, we're kind of elevating what we think about our brand. Um, and it's, it's been fun as hell. But it's certainly, it's not come without difficulties. On the environmental front, uh, I'm curious of, you know, I see you guys donate your spent grain, which is wonderful. And, you know, a lot of breweries do that. Um, uh, there's been renewed conversations in the last couple of years about some of the inefficiencies in brewing. Um, and, you know, packaging materials that are not recyclable or... Um, you know, wastewater is a big thing, you know, these days and the municipal impacts that it's having on, you know, clean water and uh, all, all of the various impacts. What do you see as some of the, I don't know, deficiencies in the brewing space with negative environmental impacts that can be addressed right yep. now? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk maybe high level and then, sure. uh, Ryan, if you've got some stuff specifically on brewing. I mean, I will say this, right? It, any company, any person, right? We are we are net polluters. Um, we have a long way to go at Madtree. I think some of the things that I, I love to see us do, um, our composting initiative was really something that we just like tried one weekend. So basically we said, anything that you get at Madtree is compostable. There is no trash, unless right an employee brings it in for their lunch or something, but there is no trash at Madtree, essentially. So the only trash that we have is what people bring from outside in. So everything's compostable, everything's reusable. Um, that's been huge. Like I think our 95%, maybe 98% of what we get rid of is, I mean, I think we've got like two trash cans and 30 com compost bins or whatever it is. Um, so that's been huge. Water's massive. We got, we got a lot of work to do on that, but just thinking about how we clean tanks more efficiently, I think we're roughly seven, eight to one, which is not great. Okay. Right? Breweries like New Belgium and Sierra might be three to one in terms of right beer to, to water. Um, we're not the worst, but we're certainly we're not doing great in that aspect. One of the cool things we do, and it becomes a great piece of POS, um, we put uh, uh, pack tech collectors out at a bunch of accounts, and yeah. then we'll go and grab them from the accounts. And honestly, it's a great way to be like, we're doing you a service here. People see your business as a business that gives a shit. And then we get right mad tree pack tech recycling. It's a piece of POS for us as well. So that's been kind of cool. I, you know, I, it's interesting that you're saying that because like I've seen those collection bins and like I've, I've thought about it and I just toss them in my recycling, uh, which I guess I'm not really supposed to do. Um, uh, or I reuse them or, or whatever. Um, how does that work though? Like how, like how does that, how does that recycling program yeah, so what we... For pack tech work. Yeah, we collect roughly ten to 20,000 pack techs a month. We put them in a big forkliftable tote. Ten to 20,000 a month? Yeah, yeah, through our space and then through all the collection points. Really? Um, which is probably, honestly, probably still not making up. I'd have to do the math. Probably still not making up for how many we actually put out in the wild. Okay. Um, that just seems like a really high number for it, some It is a big yeah. number, yeah. Yeah, and then we send them back to um, pack tech, the company. Okay. Um, and yeah. then they just... Yeah, we'll recycle and then yep. send them back out to new consumers and that yep. kind of thing. Okay. But can you do, like, could you just use them again in your own tap room or is there, they have to like, refit, like refurbish them or something? Yeah, we don't, we don't use them again because when they start to bend, they don't go through the machine well. And then a lot of times one of the little tabs will break. Okay. Um, and then when I put it in there, you might not notice right away. Consumer picks up a six pack can. And one falls. falls. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. You're going to jump in on something. We actually have a lot of other local breweries that, that bring their pack techs us as well, too. Really? So, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a, everybody's bought in on it. Um, yeah. 
But as far as environmental impacts, you know, day-to-day -day brewing, are there things that you'd like to see improved in the brewing world, you know, not even in your own four walls, but beyond as well? Yeah, I mean, exactly what Brady said is water. Um, water usage, water consumption, um, that's a big focus of us going, for us going into next year. We've got a couple different teams built of, of different production employees uh, that, that touch water in different ways, and we're really just trying to maximize our efficiencies there, and we're actually um, putting in a pH neutralization uh, building outside to actually start our wastewater side stream um, project, so. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like, does that, it, it's not gonna change or impact the beer at all, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's just the right thing to be doing, right? I mean, yeah, there's no yeah. like impacts. No, you know, it yeah. won't impact the, the beer at all. I mean, everything we do, obviously we wanna make sure that that's the first thing and it doesn't impact. You know, to make sure we're putting the right product out there, um, but yeah. Um, what have you missed about festivals? Seeing all of our friends from other breweries. I, I mean, it, just the connection with this community is so amazing. Um, and it's, it's my favorite thing at festivals, just connection with the brewery, seeing people you haven't seen. Um, it's, it, it was so much fun. It was, it was too much fun last night, but yeah, uh, yeah that, that's probably the most thing I missed for sure. Yeah, it's funny you asked this. Uh, Ryan and I were actually talking about, we were listening to your interview with Ben from Gigantic on the way down here. And okay. you would ask him a very similar question. Yeah. And, and Ryan paused it and he's like, how would you answer that question? And I was like, I think I'd answer it exactly like Ben answers it, right? I mean, this idea like... To be I fair, I don't remember that interview. Like, not for any alcohol yeah. reasons, but like, I love it when people quote the show to me. <laughs> you know, like, wow, it was a really cool conversation no memory of it yeah like no like just no, i record yeah. it and then i forget about it people yeah, are like yeah, you yeah. don't listen to it afterwards like, nope no. i do not listen to my own show no. yeah it's <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, essentially right you were asking him does 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 a lot of these festivals right they do he was doing a festival in porto that's right yeah um do they build the brand and and for us you know i don't know the answer to that question does being down at funk fest you know these funky beers make up probably less than a half a percent of our business if that yeah so does this really build our brand i don't know um is it worth the few thousand dollars that we spend to come down and do everything i don't know but to ryan's point it's fun as shit it builds culture it, it frankly keeps me excited um but it's festivals like this right it's not no disrespect to the the standard as as brandon would say lemonade style uh distributor uh, fest yeah, but yeah. I, I don't get excited about those um I haven't been to one of them, honestly, in a few years. Yeah. Um, but uh, this, this, and I'm, I'm really excited for Ryan to experience for the first time. This is, to me, the example of just how a beer fest should be. So. What do you mean by that? Like, like, what are the good hallmarks of this fest that, like, makes you say that? Yeah, I think it's, it's good people. Um, the, the hospitality, right? Like... Anytime you have a beer festival, I think as the hosting brewery, you kind of have a responsibility to make sure that, that there's a weekend plan and that people have a good time. Um, and there's like, you know, I mean, I don't know a lot of these guys, obviously, as well as Brandon does, but I mean, it's just good people. Like, you can just, you just feel it. Um, it's very warm. Um, and there's, there's, there's a connection, right? There's, there's something deeper than just showing up pouring beers. So. Does that translate through to the consumer experience, do you think? Like, if you're happy to be here, that's got to show, right? And that's just got to, like, sort of elevate. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I also love this beer festival because I'm probably going to see 10 to 20 people. I'm not going to know their names um, that I see every single year at this festival. Yeah. And they're people that have connections with Brandon. And because of our connection with them, there's almost like, it's almost like we're friends automatically. Yeah. And that's... That's special, right? It's, it's not the beer festival where someone's coming up saying, give me the, the highest ABV beer you have so I can get hammered and, right, yeah. There's been a trend, though, of breweries hosting festivals. So, like, it used to be, you know, when I was the editor at All About Beer, like, you know, there, there, there was that company put on, you know, festivals at the baseball stadium every year that would bring breweries from around the country, but it was the magazine that put it on, you know, the company that put it on. Um, you know, and then there's distributor fests and there's, you know, the Great American Beer Festival. There's like outside organizations. But there has been, especially I think within the last five or so years, a lot more breweries putting on festivals of all sizes. Some really big, some, you know, more intimate, you know, like this. Um, is that, like from a brewer's standpoint, like is there something appealing about just hanging out with other brewers and... You know, like, what's it like for you to be at something like this? Like, yeah, that's 
like know. Brady was saying, this, these are the most appealing festivals to me. You know, um, we all learn from each other. Um, there are some really smart minds here. We all love beer. Yeah. Um, we all love to share information with each other. Um, so I always make sure that when I come to these events, I walk away learning something new. You know. What do you look for? That's a great question. Um, I don't have I don't have something I come in looking for. But if there's a beer that like, oh shit, all right like inspires me a little bit then i know i can like seek out that brewer and talk to him you know what i'm saying i kind of pick his mind on on how he got what he got out of it or she got out of it um and yeah how much of the beers just to go back to recipes for just a second because I'm, I'm i'm curious about this because i was having a conversation recently uh about homage beers and you know things that inspired people to make beer like get them on their beer journey how, how much of the beers that you've made have been I don't know, inspirational. Like, you know, came from inspiration from drinking something else. Is it most of the beers? Is it a few of the beers? Or, you know, are you really just sort of trying to guide your own recipes so that they have your own mark on them? Um, it's probably a little bit 50-50. Okay. Um, at this point, it's, you know, we've learned a lot through what we do. I mean, we make 100 new beers a year through our tap room. Wow. Um, so... Actually, I don't know if that's a lot. That sounds like a lot, but like I, that's know, two I, a week, yeah, yeah, more or less. Yeah, 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 two to three new beers a week. I mean, we we have the tap room capacity to handle it. Um, so I'd say th there are there are definitely some of those classic beers out there that inspire have inspired me through recipes and stuff like that. I mean, I'd be lying to you if I if, if I didn't tell you I drank a lot of Pivo Pills when I was creating this recipe for our lager. You know? Okay. Because uh, I I absolutely love that beer. Yeah. Um, and um, it's so you know. I definitely look for inspiration from other breweries, uh, but I also look at our team for inspiration. You know, like I said, when we have multiple people on our team that create recipes, um, we all do a good job inspiring each other and learning from each other. Is there a style of beer that you wish consumers were paying more attention to? Lager. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you this. Much. I mean, by yeah. volume, some of the best-selling beers in America are or lagers or pilsners. Yeah. I mean, they're made by larger companies, but... And most people come on our tap room and ask for our hazy. Okay. <laughs> you know? Um, and we'll have, sometimes have one or two on, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of this beer, and, and we worked really hard on it. Um, and they're hard as shit to make, too. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's probably one of the reasons why people pay... I wish people paid attention to them more. I don't think a lot of consumers understand the simplest beers are the hardest beers to make. Yeah. Yeah, I would say dark beers. Um, I, I hate... And it drives me nuts because we, we, we get the consumer feedback from people who really appreciate beers that they're like, why don't you have any dark beers on the shelf? And I do feel, I hate to say it, I feel a bit beholden by what we've accomplished from a volume standpoint as a brewery that we can't just put a brown ale or an English mild on the shelf every day. But frankly, it just doesn't have the velocity to stick. And, yeah. you know, we, we used to have a beer called Gnarly Brown. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to say that. Hopefully, um, uh, Delicato Gnarly Head Wine is not listening. It got changed to Naughty Brown, because obviously the consumers would get confused between Gnarly Head Wine and Gnarly Brown. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that... I'm that, glad to see you're not holding on to any grudges. <laughs> That's... <laughs> uh, yeah, we did send them... Uh, I don't think they were listening. We did, we did send them a fun care package. Okay. Uh, <laughs> We'll talk about that after. Yeah, it's another, yeah. Uh, they, I, I will say they did send us a really nice bottle of wine um, okay. that my partner didn't share with me. I don't, I don't know why. I'm, st I'm still bitter about that. But, like, that, that was a beer we launched with right off the rip. And, God, it's such a beautiful beer. Um, but, frankly, like, it just didn't have the velocity. And we were losing placements at Kroger. So, right, if you want to keep the placements at stick, you got to stay in IPA land. IPA, 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 and then maybe lager. Um, you know, we have an amber locally that does extremely well for us to love the beer we won gold at gabf a few years ago with it yeah um that beer that beer's been able to kind of stick but that's one of the few examples of even like an amber ale on the on the shelf is there a disconnect between what sells on the shelf and what sells in the tap room though um a little bit but it's not yeah uh, yeah I, I i think there is i think i will say like so our lager right our lagers our number one seller at the tap room and I believe that's in our IPA is our number one seller out in distribution. And our IPA probably is two to one, um, our lager out in distribution. And our lager is probably two to one, our IPA in the tap room. There's a lot more beers on too. But I think a lot of consumers come into our tap room exactly like we said earlier, right? 
they're there to meet someone for a, for you know a, a work meeting maybe not a big beer drinker they just want the easiest thing hey what do you have that's light so that's why lager kind yeah. of goes across the bar if they're going out to a Kroger shelf to buy a beer they might be buying Bud Light right sure so. So I've been asking uh, folks for the last couple of weeks on this show, I've been saying uh, my wife and I were watching um, uh, The Good Place again, and there's this uh, whole concept of being able to walk through a green door uh, and be anywhere uh, at any point in time with whoever you want, uh, whatever you want to do. And so if such a thing existed in our physical universe, uh, and you could walk through a door and be at a pub somewhere or a bar somewhere uh, with somebody, where would you go and who would you be with? I, li- I, li- I like stumping people with this. This is good, yeah. It's a, this is an awesome question. Um, the, probably one of my favorite trips every year is the pilgrimage to, to Yakima for hop selection. Um, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm sure you've been out there. I'm sure you've been to score. Uh, it's been a few years, but yeah. yeah. Um, a few years back, we ended up in the middle of a hop field, and they had a taco truck there and beer on draft, and Ken Grossman was there just hanging out. And I fucking, we got sat down with Ken. I introduced myself, had some tacos, had a beer. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I would love to do something like that again. I mean, it, it was so much fun. Dude's inspirational. Um, and to be in the middle of a hot field, eating tacos and drinking beer. I mean, what's oh, that yeah. to like? No, that's... Uh... Yeah, that's funny. Um, I was actually thinking, like, a beer with Ken Grossman in the early days would be one. Um, I don't know, man. Hanging out with hanging out with Jones at Ponch and Kelder in in Brussels. That was a yeah. pretty pretty magical experience. <laughs> um, I, I, the Belgian beer bars, yeah, just take me to a different place. Um, I absolutely loved. I've only been there once, but I kind of toured the you know Ghent, Bruges, Antwerp, and Brussels, and that was special. Um, you know, I I had probably one of the best beer experiences in my life so maybe this would be it I, I know it's a it's a hypothetical green door but you know yeah. the real green door I was at um, oh god I'm blanking on the name of the place it's in Antwerp massively famous Belgian beer bar yeah, I'll google it in a second okay. um, but it was really cool I, I so I, I go up I'm by myself it's my first day in, in Belgium I go up and there's I see people sitting in the window I couldn't tell if it was open I knock on the door the owner comes out who could be a bit of a crotchety man, like most Belgian beer bar owners. Sure. Um, he says, can I help you? And I'm like, yeah, I just wanted to come in for a beer. And he goes, do you come to drink beer or taste beer? Or savor beer, I think he said. Being kind of a smart ass, I was like, ah, I kind of like to do both. And he starts to kind of like shut the door on me a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, but tonight I'll savor beer. So he lets me in, takes him a while to warm up to me. And then by the end of the night, we're all sitting at one table and we're just popping open all kinds of beautiful Belgian beers oh, that's cool. and it was really cool because there was a guy from South Africa um, a lady from China a couple from New Zealand Belgian guy myself from the US and I think there was one South American I can't remember where but I was sitting there I was like man we got like five continents represented at this table right now and just talking over beer and it was an absolutely magical night uh, the, the place was Culminator I mean, okay I think that's the name of the place yeah yeah, yeah. okay but just beautiful experience um, last question, because I know you guys got to go set up in a minute, but uh, you, you actually reminded me when you were talking about hop selection and, uh, uh, you know, Citra Mosaic are obviously the ones that are getting everybody uh, still excited these days. Have you had anything, uh, any of the new experimentals, anything uh, different or old that's going to be new again that's sort of exciting you on the hop front that, uh, you know, I know you were naming the th- the the... the three C hops earlier, but aside from that, like, are there? Um, we've actually had some pretty good success with Lotus. Um, with the Lotus? Yeah. Okay. And a pretty fun beer, uh, uh, fun hop to, uh, it pairs well with Citra and Sabro. Um, get some really cool, fun pineapple notes out of it. Um, okay. So that's, that's been one that we've used a lot recently. Um, and I really like Sabro as well. I know that's a, a hop that I think a lot of brewers have a love-hate relationship with. Um, but I think when it's used right, um, just that under, undertone of coconut that you get out of it with some tropical notes, it's, it's a lot of fun to play with. All right. Those are two to keep paying attention to. Keep yeah, looking. Um, well, guys, thanks for, thanks for sitting down. Thanks for being on the show this week and for taking the time uh, after a late night and uh, an early morning before the fest. Yeah, I appreciate it. We had a lot of fun and uh, looking forward to the festival as well. Yeah. Cheers, guys.
It was a lot of fun being back in festival mode, and this particular one was really well done. A small crowd, all outside, with a pretty chill vibe. I will encourage you to put Funk Fest on your list for 2022. But in the meantime, what's on your festival radar? Let me know. It's John Hall, J O H N H O L L at beeredge.com or on Twitter at John underscore Hall. And of course, Beer Edge is on all of the social media channels at The Beer Edge. And if you love smoked beers, and of course you do, a reminder to check out the This Week in Rauk Beer group on Facebook or on Twitter and Instagram at TW Rauk Beer. And if you're interested in advertising, please reach out to Liz Melby. She's at Liz at BeerEdge.com, and she'll let you know all of the information that you need. And speaking of that, this episode was made possible by the support of Brees, who has been malting barley for 145 years. And the fifth generation of family ownership is currently leading the company. But the values have always remained the same, producing the highest quality, most consistent malt, and working directly with their customers to help them succeed. From Pilsners to Porters and everything in between, Brees offers the finest handcrafted malts, extracts, and adjuncts to help you brew the perfect beer. And we're also brought to you by NZ Hops. In a little country far down in the Pacific, you'll find a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. Years of partnerships with a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations sees the current day master growers proudly providing 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz or find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd to learn more. And the best brewmasters are obsessed with creating a high quality, consistent product. That means reducing mass viscosity for better wart separation and increasing brew house efficiency. Ultra Flow Max from Novozymes helps you achieve both. It's time to brew with enzymes, increase your brew house efficiency, and achieve faster filtration today with Ultra Flow Max. Order a free sample today at brewingwithenzymes.com slash beer edge. And one last reminder to go to beeredge.com to see all that we have going on, to check out the Beer Edge podcast hosted by Andy Crouch. Steal This Beer has new episodes every Monday, and the BYO Nano podcast drops new episodes on the 15th of every month. And as for this show, well, Nate Schweber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed the logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer. <laughs>